Good morning. This morning, uh, we have one of <laughs> the harshest versions in the Gospels and one of the harshest versions in the Bible of this basic rule. God wants you to love your neighbors as yourself because in doing so, you love God. That's the basic rule. That's the way in which I, at least, and many others, look at every other thing that is written in the Bible, every other letter, every other revelation, every other prophecy, every other story of Jesus, every other story about God and God's people and encounters with God. That what God really wants us to figure out in this world, figure out and practice and do in the external world and in our own hearts, is to love ourselves and love our neighbors. And when we do so, we end up loving God. And we don't have to understand why loving ourselves and loving our neighbors means that we love God. We trust that it is true. And when you look at the whole Bible and you look at it from this standpoint, there's a lot that does not seem to make sense because it does not seem to have anything to do with loving your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, those are the tricky bits. <laughs> those are the bits that we don't just throw out or ignore, but that we, like a Rubik's Cube, try to figure out, okay, well, would it help if we understood the context of the time? Okay, well, we'll shift the Rubik's Cube around and see if we can get a couple of colors to align. And would it help if we understood the culture of, of the place where the story was being told? Okay, well, we shift the Rubik's Cube around and see if we can get some more colors in line. And so there are times in the Bible with different stories, because there are so many stories in the Bible, that when we understand the context and the original history and the culture of the people and the culture of the invading nations, because there's always invading nations, then the Rubik's Cube starts to come out and we can get a pretty solid color on each side and see, oh, okay, so this is what they meant and this is how they were trying to love their neighbors as themselves, but ha, oh look, they failed. And let's be honest, judging, <laughs> judging the past by the standards of the present is always a little tricky to begin with. And to be honest, this, this rule that Jesus makes so clear for us, I mean, it was there in the Ten Commandments. It was there in the various tellings of the Ten Commandments, which offer more than ten. It was there in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Um, it was there in Genesis. But it was a bit obscured by everything else. And you could interpret it more than one way. And it was really Jesus who distilled it to love yourself, love your neighbor, and thereby love God. When we look at that, we can call that a modern standard, but in truth, it's an ancient standard because Jesus lived 2,000 years ago and he was the one who put it out there. He was the one who distilled that from the even more ancient law. He interpreted it for us. But let's be clear here. For the time in which he lived, that was almost an impossibly high bar to meet. It stumped all of his students, or presumably all of his students. There may have been a few that have not been recorded in the historical record who are like, oh, right, we get it. But the people who wrote the historical record didn't get it or they largely didn't get it, or sometimes they got it, but then they continued to misunderstand in other times. And so, you know, history is written by, well, at least the people who survived. So these are the historical records we have. 
And so we can say at least most of his students didn't really f understand how you possibly could love your neighbor as yourself. Didn't really understand what that had to do with God. And let's be honest, it's still a high bar today. It's still a high bar today. And one of the things that is interesting and fascinating, at least it has been for me, when I start reading the Bible with this context, because I've read the Bible since I've been old enough to read. It was one of the very first books I tackled. And certainly I've heard the Bible since way before I was able to read. But understanding this, this rule, this law, this guideline that Jesus has set out for us, love yourself, love your neighbor, and therefore love God. It's, it's a beautiful little logical equation there. That came to me rather later in life. That was not something my parents handed down to me. That was not something I got in the church of my childhood. And so reading the Bible that I have read so many times before, and some of these stories, beloved and gory and depressing and terrifying and bizarre, big on the bizarre, reading them all again, with these new pair of glasses on the tip of my nose that says, the important thing to remember is to love your neighbor as yourself. It's amazing what you can find in the Bible that totally corresponds with that. It's almost shocking how much there is amidst the blood and the gore, amidst the sex and the violence and the betrayal, oh, the betrayal, so much betrayal. But it's also perhaps darkly amusing how much, especially in the New Testament, how much goes away from this? How much when you look at a letter particularly if it's not a letter from Paul, but it says it's a letter from Paul, because there are plenty of those, the Deutero-Pauline letters, um, because that was an ancient thing to, um, to write in the persona of someone you admired and perhaps someone you've studied under. Uh, that was not considered plagiarism. Or, I don't know, libel or sedition. Um, and so... It's, it's amazing when you look at some of the gospel passages and some of the letters and some of the other writings. There are not many more in the New Testament than gospel and letters, but there are two. Um, and look at it and think about it from the context of the most important thing is love yourself and love your neighbor and therefore love God. There's some stuff in there that's got nothing to do with that. And you know, it's completely reasonable to think that not everything that Jesus says in the Gospels, that Jesus actually said walking around the earth and teaching his disciples, because the Gospels were written almost a complete generation later, almost a full 20 years later. Some of them farther along than that. And the idea of preserving the master's words exactly, that was not actually a high priority. They didn't have the same sense of journalistic integrity, of direct quotes that, that we have today. And if you've ever actually been interviewed by a reporter, even today, they can often misquote you and you can seem to say exactly the opposite of what you had intended or what you in fact actually said. And the thing is, back then, when the Gospels were, were being written between 
oh, about between 50 AD, roughly, maybe the earliest was around 45 or 50, to oh, maybe even as late as 110 AD. And remember, Jesus died at 33, 33 AD or arguably 30 AD, depending on how you think about it. Um, it. At the earliest, it was 20 years later that they started writing things down. At the latest, it was, what, 80 years later? 80 years. And so, even though it may be hard for us to stomach, or even consider, there is a really great likelihood that everything that Jesus is purported to say in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he didn't actually say. And that some of the things that he said, you know, a bit was taken, and then the person who wrote down his words later, the community of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, they added a little to the story. They twisted it a little bit. They embellished. They changed it. Now, why would they do that? Why would they do that? Well, first of all, they did not highly prize direct quotes. That, that was not super duper important to them. What was super duper important to them was getting people to understand that they needed to follow Jesus. That Jesus was the son of God. That he was the savior of all humankind. And that they needed to dedicate their lives to him. That was their important goal. And as we have seen in centuries more recent than the first apostles, uh, the church in their effort to convince the whole world of these three things, uh, they can justify many brutal and dreadful things, the least of which is saying, Jesus said this when Jesus didn't say it. And the tricky bit is that the gospels were only starting to be written down because the people who had actually witnessed Jesus saying things, that generation had almost all completely died out. And it was the next generation that thought, crap, we got to write this stuff down. And so it's quite possible that the people who actually wrote it down never heard it from Jesus' own mouth. What they heard was the shall we say, slightly edited version that their particular apostle had given them. So why am I saying all this? Why this lesson in biblical commentary? Well, there is a beautiful portion of this reading that we got from Matthew. It's, um, it's in the 25th chapter. It's verses 31 through 46. There is a beautiful portion where Jesus is explaining, he's, seating, he's seated in judgment at the end of time. And he's metaphorically separating out the sheep from the goats. And if you are in fact not a sheep farmer nor a goat farmer, a uh, quick one-on-one on sheep and goats. Goats are smarter than sheep. Sheep are dumb. Um, sheep don't have objects permanent, object permanence, goats do. Um, and if you put a couple of goats in with the sheep or just mix your sheep and goats, the sheep will be safer because the sheep will wander up to a predator and say, will you be my friend? Whereas the goats will think, that's a lion. That's a lion. Everybody go over there. Come on, let's stay together. Nope, 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 don't go up to the lion. Don't try to befriend the lion because uh, goats are more intelligent than sheep are. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of references in the Gospels to Jesus calling us sheep and that he is the shepherd. And, you know, those are not always favorable. <laughs> those are not always kind pastoral metaphors. Um, 
He's implying that we can't actually identify danger. We don't know good from bad. And we will wander out onto a cliff face because it seems like a good idea and get stuck there and starve to death. Because, you know, this is known behavior of sheep. And so when Jesus calls us a sheep to begin with, or, you know, a herd of sheep, eh, he's saying that we are rather pathetic and need of direction. But if you know humanity, that's a hard one to argue against. So, so in this story, back to Matthew 25, little sidebar, back to Matthew 25. In this story, he's talking about, you know, the sheep and the goats. And he's saying that the sheep are the good ones and the goats are the bad ones. Um, and so already the more intelligent goats are getting a bad rap. But he's saying to all the sheep, you know, when you, you get the goods, you get to go to heaven. Because, not because you're stupid, but because when I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Now, quick sidebar about prison. It's not just, oh, wow, we go to prison and we visit people. No, it's uh, in ancient prison, in Roman prisons, uh, if... A prisoner didn't get a visitor, they would die because the jailers didn't give them food. <laughs> the jailers didn't give them water. It was their visitors who gave them food and water. So if you want the person in prison to last more than like two days, uh, you really need to visit them. So when I was in prison, you visited me. And you know, the sheep are like, uh, don't remember doing that to you. Want to say more about that? And Jesus said, you know, Whenever you did this to the least among all humans, you did it to me, which is a beautiful understanding of love yourself, love your neighbor, and therefore love God. When you treat any member of the human populace kindly, Jesus is saying you're treating him kindly. Now, he's not directly equating that with God the Father right now, but it is enough that he is equating it with God the Son. He's saying that whenever you do anything remotely kind that someone else perhaps does not deserve, you're doing it to him. And he's saying that if you've ever done that, the way forward is clear for you. And you are on the road to heaven. And then he says to the goats, ditto, but you didn't. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me a glass of water. When I was naked, you just left me there being naked and I froze to death. When I was sick, you didn't visit me. You didn't help me. When I was in prison, you left me there to rot. And the goats are like, don't remember doing that to you, Jesus. If we'd seen you there, we would have helped you. And uh, Jesus said, mm. you didn't do it to any piece of humanity, any part, any morsel, any person left in the gutter. And therefore, you didn't do it to me. And therefore, you live in hell. And you know, it strikes me that it's not necessarily saying, you know, at the end of all time, there will be a judgment and you'll go to heaven or hell. You can certainly interpret it, interpret it this way, and Lord knows people have. But it strikes me that when you and I, and everyone, and anyone, fail to help, fail to have a heart for someone else. When we fail the empathy test, when we fail to have even, even a speck of dust's worth of compassion for someone else, 
friends, we are stuck in a hell of our own making. And you know, that's not to say that constantly giving out clothing, constantly letting homeless people sleep in your spare room, that's not to say that that heals the world all at once, like waving a magic wand or using a silver bullet. But if all the world had a mind to be kind to others, things would begin to change and we would not be living in a hell of our own making. We would be on the road to heaven, to the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And it's not just charity and handouts. It's not really what it's about. It's about having compassion in your heart because charity and handouts, those are emergency measures. And you know what? Emergencies call for emergency measures. Oh yes, they do. Yes, they do. And long-term systemic poverty calls for the undermining of the foundations of systemic poverty. And you know what? Great thinkers have figured out how to do that. And no, it's got very little to do with emergency charity. No, that's true. And it's a much, it's a much longer thing to describe than this sermon is going to go into. But it exists. But if we cannot even fathom giving someone emergency aid when they're in an emergency, and maybe that emergency is caused because of a natural disaster or pandemic, or maybe that emergency is caused because their life is constantly on the edge. They live constantly on the edge. And they have perhaps even for generations. And they were born into it. And they really have no idea how to get out of it. Because friends, trust me, if they knew how to get out of it, they would. No one wants to live on the edge. It's very stressful. It doesn't actually matter. What matters is, can we have compassion? Can we be the sort of people who would reach out and help if we could? Maybe not every time, but once is enough. Can we demonstrate that we've had compassion? Can we open our minds to understand that the way we treat other people is the way we treat God? Because if we can, then we are already on the way to heaven, even now. And if we can't, if we just simply cannot, under any circumstances, imagine that, friend, you're already in hell. You can get out any time but it's gonna involve compassion and that's gonna be hard sell for you. And so maybe, maybe Jesus said this one after all. Amen.